Uncle Christopher. Grandpa believed Grandma treated Uncle Christopher like a baby. But Grandma thought Grandpa was too harsh on Uncle Christopher. Like when he saw Grandpa sing a sewing machine, Grandpa said, your son is a thief. But Grandma said, my darling, he's just a child. Uncle Christopher was in his late 30s then, and I was 10. He had a pot belly which earned him the Mr. President nickname. We would call him a chair. During the summer, he used to walk without a shade on and would compete with each other, trying to count the hairs on his chest. Uncle Christopher taught us all the survival skills we needed at that time, like sneaking into Grandpa's garden to steal guavas and sugar cane without leaving any trail, or how to redeem chunks of meat from the big basin when they had slaughtered a pig or a cow or a goat. He once got us into trouble when he didn't want us not to steal the kidneys because that was Grandpa's favorite meat. Grandpa's favorite pastime was to spit head on Uncle Christopher. He had the habit of sitting on his wooden fold-up chair, talking to himself and sucking his teeth. Most times, what he used to speak didn't make any sense, but if you got close enough, you'd know it was all about Uncle Christopher. He was always complaining about what went wrong. He had managed to raise all his children into well-behaved children who grew up to get stable jobs and raise families, like my mom, her sisters, and my other uncle, who was working in, in town. While Uncle Christopher was constant like home in the village, a constant thorn in Grandpa's flesh. When my cousins and I were around, Grandpa would joke a lot and tell us stories, but he would turn stone silent the moment Uncle Christopher walked in, and the moment he walked out, he would suck his teeth and become his normal self again, telling stories and jokes and all. He hated everything about Christopher, including his plastic plates. How does one get married and keep using plastic plates, like he's a bachelor? He would say every time Uncle Christopher's wife brought him some food in their plastic plates. If the summer winds were blowing, he would not even touch the food at all. But when he was calm, he would tell me to open the plates. And if there was meat, he would tell us to eat together. But if it was vegetables or beans, he would say, take this to the women. You were never sure about Grandpa's reaction if Uncle Christopher was involved in the equation. Grandpa loved meat so much. Mom said it's because he was getting older and he needed the proteins. But Grandpa told us he worked as a chef for a white family in South Africa and white people have meat in their meal every day. Not all the vegetables poisoned they were feeding him daily. When Grandpa had prepared his meal with meat, he would say, pray manje. When we had only vegetables, he would say, Manje, the women have, have already prayed for the food when they are preparing it. And would go straight into the eating. His reason being that if God did not receive Cain's vegetarian sacrifice, then God loved me too. In Grandpa's presence, we would pretend we didn't like Uncle Christopher too. Grandma and my mother seemed to be the only ones who deeply cared about Uncle Christopher. Grandma was so protective of him that he wouldn't say anything bad about Uncle Christopher in his presence in her presence without being slapped or being denied a taste of one of the delicious meals she was always cooking. When you told her what Grandpa said Uncle Christopher, he would say he is getting too old. If he has nothing better to do, why does he, doesn't he just go to the farm? Grandma was always angry with Grandpa because he thought Grandpa never took into consideration the fact that Uncle Christopher had a mental condition when he was five. They had to take him to a singer for a whole two months before he became his normal self and he never really became his normal self. Grandpa said he was shaping us to be men. We were supposed to take his sermons on manhood as the gospel. He told us about being the first one to rise and the last one called bed in the compound. About not spending much time with the women in the compound because the women are always gossiping and nagging. About being heads of our families and not to let ourselves be ruled by their underpinned governments. He told us a man should know a minimum and should have food all year round. He didn't just talk, he led by example. He had maize granaries, dating to three harvests back while Uncle Christopher lived from hand to mouth. When he wanted to point out a bad example of being a man, he said, just look at your uncle. When he wanted to highlight a point on laziness, he would say, take a look at your uncle's house. He can't even make it waterproof. Is that a house or a cattle crow, man? We would answer him that it's a cattle crow and 
you rave on and on about how a lazy child brings shame to his father's name, especially a son. He didn't count the women because he felt they were created to support a man. When our sisters wanted to join our chats with grandpa, we would tell him, go to the kitchen where you belong. This is men's talk. And grandpa's eyes would light up his way of approving our male chauvinism. The distaste for my uncle extended to his children as well. They were considered second class citizens in the compound. Same as the women. We would play with them, but at our own risk. If grandpa saw you playing with them, you were in trouble. He could give you the silent treatment for weeks. Grandpa would talk about Uncle Christopher in his presence in parables. He would say, look at some people trying to share a cup with the men, as if they are man enough. We would stiff our laughter because we didn't want Uncle Christopher dealing with us in Grandpa's absence. Because Uncle Christopher knew he wasn't welcome to the men's chats, he would spend most of the time with the women. This just gave Grandpa more armor. Don't be like your uncle, always sitting with the women, stealing meat from the pot with the cooking stick. The problem with his kind of warning was that it wasn't realistic. The women had all the food, and all Grandpa had was his stories. When Uncle Christopher was constructing a solar dryer for the plates, Grandpa would call me and say, Look how he's tying his knots like a monkey. Eh? Don't do the monkey knot when you go for Kigamwine. They'll know their daughter has married a lazy bum. The monkey knot is for women, not a man. What pissed Grandpa off most is that Uncle Christopher had all the chances to make it in life. Grandpa was fair, very well to do by village standards. He retired from his safe job with a lot of money, which he invested in a farm. He had cattle, pigs, goats, and lots of chickens. He wanted to buy a men's meal, but his sisters warned him that people would accuse him of witchcraft. Back in the days, no one could own a men's meal without the suspicion that every person or relative who dies in the family has been put in the men's meal. My people are here to accept that death just happens. They always find someone to blame. And if you have a men's meal, the blame is yours 90% of the time. Uncle Christopher selected to Baraga Selmer School when he wrote his standard date exams. Grandpa told us that instead of concentrating on his studies, he would jump the fence at night to go dancing in beer halls. Then he impregnated his girlfriend when he had just passed the junior certificate. That was the end of school for Uncle Christopher. He got married and went to Luangwa to cut sugar cane at Sukoma. When, he took, when the wife left him and the children for another man, Grandpa had no kind words for Uncle Christopher. He said, even the wife could see that he was not a real man. <laughs> she left the fool for a real man. Uncle Christopher married another wife, quit his job and returned to the village. This ached Grandpa even more. He wants me to keep feeding him and his brood of bastard kids. Grandpa said. We tried so hard not to be like Uncle Christopher, avoiding staying in the kitchen when Grandfather was around, though it wasn't easy, because Granny's kitchen was where the chikum was baked and the tobwa brewed. But we had to follow Grandpa's gospel. We didn't want to drop out of school because we loved dancing, or be under people good governments, or have our wives move in with other men because we are lazy and tied the monkey knots when constructing solar dryers. And as we grew older, our sisters started getting suitors. We knew Uncle Christopher was out of the question when it came to who will negotiate for their bride price and make wedding arrangements. But his elder brother was busy with work in town and could not be available to negotiate for every sister and cousin the way they were getting married. So Grandpa had to grudgingly let Uncle Christopher do the negotiation, though we knew in advance that his comments would be, he negotiates like a woman, just letting your sisters go at the price of comedy. You see my voice, eh? Learn, learn my voice. If your other uncle was here, he wouldn't have just given away your sisters like that. As the marriage advocate of our sisters, Uncle Christopher had to help in resolving their marital arguments and fights. And on days like those, we knew Grandpa would suck his teeth and stop. Grandpa died at 94, and still had not resolved his issues with Uncle Christopher. We buried him beneath the Mbawa tree, just behind his cattle crown. And as Uncle Christopher laid the wreath on his grave, we could see the pressure on him. He was the oldest man in the camp compound. Because the uncle from town could not leave his job to take care of the extended family. And now it's my turn to get married. Grandpa's lectures on manhood. Grandpa's lectures on manhood keep haunting me. I'm not sure if I want to be the man he wanted me to be. And I don't want to be Uncle Christopher. But what will I become then? 
when the only man I knew and I can copy from is him and Uncle Christopher. 